So this next section that we're going to talk about is my condenser, right? And our refrigeration cycle, that's a really simple drawing. It just shows the condenser, right? On, our, on my supermarket drawing, here's where I've, I've come out of my heat reclaim, and now I'm headed to my condenser. So this is the, this is the section the next class is going to be on, is my condenser and all the things that, I'm, that I use to control my low ambient. That's what's going to be next. Uh, and then we're going to be talking about subcooling and pressurizing the, the receiver and all those bits and pieces. We've got to know this part in detail this time of year, right? This is one of those things we can literally forget half the year. But come winter, this is when all the problems with these valves not being set right or not working properly show up. When I say low ambient, I'm talking about outside temperature falling to the point where my condenser is too big. All right, what would happen if I did nothing? If I just left my condenser running exactly as it was and it was just too big? Drop your discharge pressure. Discharge pressure is going to fall. All right, how far can it fall and us not have any problems? 140 psi. You got you got a number. 140. Yeah. On the money. All right, so what determines when refrigeration stops working based on discharge pressure? Going to superheat. When you start to condense and you're separated? <laughs> well, that's a good question. Wait, say that question. What determines? All right, so any system, doesn't matter what system, right? At, at what point, if my discharge pressure falls, does that system stop refrigerating? Um, stop getting pressure drop across your house. Bingo. Boom! Dang. When you max. Go max. When you want. All right. So if you guys didn't hear him or, or you just want me to say this in a different way, the pressure difference across our expansion device or our metering device, there's a requirement for that metering device, right? It's usually 90 pounds. Okay. Can't give me something else, but that's a general, generally accepted number, about 90 PSI. So if my discharge pressure falls, so that my suction stays the same, but my discharge keeps getting closer and closer to that 90, right? My expansion device is going to stop being as effective, right? When I get down to 50, may not be working at all. 40, definitely struggling massively. Okay, so so I got to keep I got to keep that pressure difference. That's really the key. Okay, now if it keeps dropping beyond that, and my and my expansion device isn't my problem, I'm not refrigerating at all because of my expansion, but if it kept dropping, then I'm going to have a compression ratio problem when my compressor will be the next thing that will happen. I won't have enough compression ratio and my valves won't seat, they'll flutter. Okay, when they flutter they almost always break. Okay, so so that's the second thing that's going to happen, but that's, we're getting, you know, five, we're talking five, ten pounds difference from suction to discharge. Okay, so I'm probably not going to damage my compressor I could uh, if I ignored the service calls I'm getting for all my cases running warm. That's what's going to happen long before I damage the compressor. I'm going to, my expansion devices are going to lose that differential. They're going to stop working. My superheat's going to go astronomical, and all my cases are going to start running warm. Okay? So, so I've got to control that. I've got, to, I've got to adjust how much heat I'm rejecting in my condenser as my temperature falls. All right? And my temperature, living on planet Earth, can be can really fall. The difference between our highest and our lowest temperatures can be 100 degrees. Mm -hmm. You know, you put a you put a condenser on the roof in Florida in July and August, 120, 130 degrees up there, right? Can we hit 20 or 30 degrees at night, January 17th? No. Nope. 2 a.m. No. <laughs> right? So so it can be it can be dramatic. You know, 100, 100 degrees is pretty, and now I'm talking Florida, right? Up in Maine, you know, minus 30 happens. So how are we going to do this, right? So when we're looking at our, our uh, hot gas, here's my hot gas line coming up towards my condenser. Guess what? It's hitting another three-way valve, right? My condenser itself is broken into two halves. That's why this red pipe is here and this one's here. I've got all these even-numbered fans on one bank. All my odd-numbered fans are on the other bank. They are two separate condensers, 
right? We think of them as one, but really they're not, yeah. right? We, when we say 100%, we're talking about running this as one condenser, right? When we talk about 50%, that means we're shutting one of these two circuits off completely, and we don't have any refrigerant in it, right? That's a 50% split. Guess what, as you start moving farther north, there's a 25, right? That means we'll have three condensers here, and one of these 50% is actually two. Okay, so we can uh -huh. shut that, we can shut half of half down, right? So we can get down to 25%, okay? That's also fairly common, huh. right? So, so when we're talking about our split, we're talking about are you in split or not? That's what we're talking about. Are you in 50%? Are you running the whole enchilada? Okay, that's, the, those, that's what those words mean, okay? When we talk about seasonal, when you, you'll see this word sometimes printed right on the, you know, right there at a pipe. If it says seasonal, that means it's the half that we, we're turning on and off. I need it in the summer, I don't need it in the winter. It's a seasonal condenser. That's, that's the half we turn on and off. If you see the 100%, right? Now this one gets confusing. Walmart uses the terms 50% and 100% on their uh, little tags sometimes. Right? Their 50% means that that's the one that's always on. Mm -hmm. Right? The 100% means I bring that on to get to 100%. Right? Other manufacturers do it the other way around. They say 100%, this one runs 100% of the time, and they don't even mark the other one. Right? So if you see that labeling, just understand, you know, just understand that could be a little bit confusing. There, there is a way to know. What's that? Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, when you say turn it on to get to 100%, you, you mean turn it, like, they're, I, they're normally those in salt. Yes. Right? So, so, so there's two versions, and what we're talking about right now is three-way valve. Oh, yeah. All right, we'll get to the solenoid setup in a minute. But this is actually more common. So, you know, looking at this, at this three-way valve, if we, if we back up, uh, do I have a picture of that? No, no, we're not there. Yet. Let, let's, uh, if we look at this guy, this is my drawing, right? Um, I've got my hot gas coming in, and my full time is coming out the bottom, right? So if we go to this drawing, we can see that that is my full time because it's what's coming out the bottom. Will there be two, since you can only do one of the All right, we'll, we'll get there in a second. You're pointing out the difference between the two valves. Yeah. Okay, and I'll show you the inside in a minute. But that is it, right? Our last valve for heat reclaim it was one or the other, on or off. All right, this one, it's obviously, that's not going to work. Yeah. Right, something's got to be different. So we'll take a look at the inside and see how that puck works yeah. and how, how we're able to run 50% or 100 Okay, off the same thing. But when I'm looking at this, I can follow the pipes and figure out which half is my full time, which half is my quote seasonal, which half am I turning on or off, right? The one that it comes out of the side is gonna be the half that I'm turning on or off. Okay, the other one's the one that's gonna be on all the time. Okay, does that make sense? All right, the other thing to note is, like I said, my fans are all even numbers up here, odd numbers down here, they're, they're labeled one, two, three, four, okay? This drawing isn't accurate in that I don't actually push my hot gas in one end of a condenser and take it out of the other on a refrigeration rack, right? The headers are all on the same side, right? I push my refrigerant in, it goes all the way through the condenser and then comes back and I come out liquid on the same end, okay? We call that the header end, right? Now, the only reason why it really matters is because this next piece that we're gonna talk about, fan control, all right? I'm going to turn those fans on and off. I'm going to turn off banks of those fans as I don't need them. And I'm going to work from the end opposite my header. So the first half I'm going to turn off. First fan I'm going to turn off. And I'm going to keep shutting those fans off until I get to the set that has my header. And I'm probably going to even leave those on all the time. All right? To keep my refrigerant flow proper. But if we don't do that and we don't... We don't keep the header in hot. We tend to log oil. That's, that's the issue, mm -hmm. right? If I have a fan out on a condenser, I could be logging oil right there, mm -hmm. right? Okay, I don't have a nice even temperature through the, 
through, I'm going to attract oil. It's going to stick to that hot spot. Okay? So anyway, that's why we do that. That's why we stage it that way. This is how. This is the how. So on this side, you know, I've got a Novar module. But this could be anything, right? Just a set of relays, right? All these relays are going to be wired normally closed. Why do we wire things normally closed? So they fail so on. They fail. fail on. If I take away my control and it's normally closed contact, it's going to run. Yeah. All right, so all my condensing fan motors are going to be wired that way so that if I lose control, I've got 100% fans. Well, if it's January 17th at 2 o'clock in the morning and I can't have 100% of my fans on, yep. what am I going to do, Corey? Carrie, sorry. Wait, say that again. I was putting that. If, if all of my fans are on because I've lost control and it's too cold outside, what am I going to do? Yeah, the discharge pressure is going to drop and start, start unplugging fans. Pull fuses out, right? Shut down fans. Shut them down the same way the computer would, farthest from the header towards the header until my pressure, until I've got a proper pressure, okay? Exactly. All right, what happens if I shut off all of my fans, yeah. the temperature keeps dropping, and so does my discharge, right? I gotta do something else. My condenser's too big now with no fans running. There's my 50% split. That's when I'm gonna energize this three-way valve, and I'm gonna turn off half of my condensing coil, all right? I'm gonna make it half its size, all right? When that happens, I'm going to turn my fans back on for that half because it's because that's a pretty dramatic change. It's 50 percent, right? So I'm going to shut off half. I'm going to kick my fans back on, all of them, and then I'm going to let them stage off again. All right. And typically here where we live, we find a very happy medium somewhere in between those two states. So what we'll find uh, in Central Florida, we we tend to go into split at the coldest part of the, of the night, two or three in the morning, you know, maybe four, something like that. We split for a little bit. Uh, we stage all our fans back on. We turn off one, you know, something like that. Then uh, daybreak, we kick on that last fan. It's back on. Pressure starts rising, climbing. It's too much. We go back to 100%, shut our fans off, and start staging them back on again, right? That's usually our cycle for our coldest days, okay? Now, on the absolute coldest day, that's not going to be enough. So we'll talk about what happens after that, right? But that's why I've got split 50% and 25. We will find some 25s the farther north we go. My Jacksonville crew probably sees 25s quite a bit on some of those older stores, particularly in Georgia. All right. So here's the inside of this particular version of our three-way valve. Here are the two. Now, the bodies of these valves are identical, right? They're literally the same body, painted the same, everything. You won't be able to look at one of these and know the difference. You've got to look uh, at the model number and look it up, right? But this guy, you can see, here's my puck. It's sitting right between these two. It's like a multi-position. Uh, right? On my other one, the puck sat against the bottom or the top, but there was no in-between. This is full travel. You can see I've got a bolt here that's sitting at the bottom. It cannot close this bottom port. All right? so, so the biggest difference is this sticks out, so I can't drop into this hole. Mm -hmm. There's a block you know, to prevent that from falling far enough. And then the throw on this is going to be shorter because it doesn't have to go from one extreme to the other. Mm -hmm. So when it hits this, it's going to close off what they're calling in this drawing summer. right? which is the 100%. Okay, it's the part we're turning on and off. Does that make sense? This is the side that I'm running all the time. You see, it's labeled summer and winter. Well, they might as well just say it runs all the time. <laughs> I never shut that off, right? Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right, so that's the difference between the two valves. Like I said, they look identical. They're piped the same, the same body, same paint color. Question. They're not interchangeable. Are any of the designations stamped on the body? Because with it being the discharge, I'm yes. guessing there's no stickers. On yeah, it. yeah. Or if there were, they're not here. <laughs> they're not here anymore. <laughs> yeah, at one point. <laughs> All right, but this is what we see most of the time. A couple interesting things about this. We've got a solenoid there with no coil on it. They're normally mm -hmm. open solenoids. Okay. Yeah. Clearly. 
have to be. That is the first thing to note, all right? Most of the solenoids, okay, when I say most, every single solenoid we touch except these are normally closed. Yeah. At rest, you cannot blow through it, right? You have to energize it to open, normally closed, mm -hmm. right? These two solenoids are the opposite. They are normally open. You pick them up out of the box, you can blow right through them. Mm -hmm. You have to energize them to close. Exact opposite. So weird. Why is that? Because you don't want it to close. <laughs> right? we, normally, we use normally open and normally close based on how we want it to fail. Mm -hmm. yep. We want our condensers to fail on, not off. We don't want to create a bomb. But if you were just to kind of just feel your pipe, you would feel, obviously, on the outlet of the valve. Like going to the condenser, right? On the one that shuts. What about it? Like if you were just like, just going to feel. Right. You would feel. While it's off, it would, it would be cold. That's what I'm saying after the valve, though. Or would it not really matter? So like, let's say the one on the right doesn't has a solenoid, and it's. Right. So, yeah. so you'll detect no difference in these two in summer mode. Right. Yeah. They're the both. The they're both. Flat. You'll burn your hand on both. Yeah. Yeah. You'll yeah. burn your hand on both. They will yeah. be the exact same temperature. If you were in split, one will be cold, the other will be hot. Yeah. If you were actually split, that's exactly right. The one with yeah. the coil is the one I'm turning off. Yeah. That side's going to be cool. Yeah. Right. The one that has no coil, I can't turn off. It has no coil. Mm -hmm. Why do they do that? Because it has to maintain pressure differential in the circuit. Right? You guys just hear that? I, I hear guys say, well, it's a spare. No. No, it's not a spare. There's not a pump out on that side. We can't reverse our 50%. We can't just say, okay, so we're going to use the other side 50%. It doesn't work that way. Right? So why are we spending $800, $900 on a solenoid and not even putting a coil on it that we're never going to use? Right? This is the part that's really important. If we're doing any piping work at all on this circuit, what I'm about to tell you is a critical fundamental piece that, you have, that has to drive your work. So here it is, here it is. If I have any difference at all in the piping between these two paths, when I'm at 100% coil, I'm going to load the side with the least restriction. And I'm not gonna flow through the other side. And I'm going off on discharge. Yep. I'm going to be running really, really, really 300 plus psi, really high pressure, right? Because of a, of a minor difference in piping. And I mean minor, right? So much so, Walmart buys thousand dollar valves and solders them in just so the the restriction will be identical yep. between the two halves. Yep. That's how important that is, right? And like I said, this ha we've got to keep this in mind when we're piping headers. Right when we're when we're touching this pipe and we're moving condensers or we're, you know whatever we're doing after after the two pipes our main discharge header splits into these two fifties until it comes back together again they must be the same. If I'm using a ninety on this side, I must use a ninety on this side. If my copper pipe is four feet long, it needs to be four feet long on the other side. Right now that I'm telling you that. You probably have asked many times, why the hell does this pipe go out and come all the way back, right? When you're standing there looking at this stuff, it doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, they both come up on the left-hand side, and i got to go all the way down there for the right. Well, guess what? I'm going to go all the way down there and then back for the left. It has to be, a, has to be the same, okay? It has to be the same. So that's why that's done that way, okay? So you know, there's two, two takeaways from this. We're using normally open solenoids. And one of them doesn't have a coil because that's the, the one that's on all the time, mm -hmm. and I have to balance my pressures. Okay? They're not interchangeable. <laughs> not interchangeable. All right, what about the other end? Right? So I've got my hot gas coming up to my condenser. I turn off a solenoid so I don't flow refrigerant through it. But those two pipes come back together. So what's to keep that refrigerant from coming back? Check into my condenser. Check the valve. Got to have a check valve. Okay? And you can see my check valves are here. And they're not piped the same. <laughs> it's the exact same amount of pipe. The check valves are sitting <laughs> in different spots. But it's exactly the same amount of pipe. Right? Okay? Same valves. Let's talk about this check valve business for a minute. That makes sense. When I'm in 100% and both sides are open, my check valves really aren't in play. My refrigerant's just flowing right through them, mm -hmm. right? When I close one of these off, 
because I've got the common header, that refrigerant is going to try to flow back into that haptic condenser. The check valve does come into play at that point. Mm -hmm. All right, so I want to isolate that condenser that I'm turning off. The reason I want to isolate it is because it's full refrigerant. Yep. It's going to condense, yep. right? So I want to get that refrigerant out and back into my system, or I'm going to run out of refrigerant. I've got a second receiver if I don't, right? Thinking of it that way. I'm going to fill my condenser full of liquid that I can't get out. I'm going to be short refrigerant. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in order to do that, you can see there's another little pipe right here, little quarter inch pipe. Well, that's the half that, that I shut off. Okay, that's the half with my coil on the solenoid. This is the same store, right? Does that make sense? My coil was on the right. Well, here's my bleed on the right. All right, and we call this a bleed because what we're going to do is we're going to bleed that liquid refrigerant very slowly out of that half we've turned off. We're gonna meter that into my suction. Yep. That's lost horsepower. Yep. Right? That's the refrigeration cycle. I went through the whole cycle, made a bunch of liquid, and I'm not doing any work with it. I'm just sending it back into the suction. Making an expansion of right? what's in here. So, so I wanna do that slow, and I don't, I don't, I don't wanna do that unnecessarily, right? But I am dumping liquid refrigerant straight into my suction header. Dropping your screen. That could be bad, right? So I'm, I've got to have some type of metering device to prevent that from flooding my compressors. Right? My check valve and my solenoid are, are what are isolating that condenser. If I walk into this rack and I see that metering device is a giant ball of ice, that means one of those two devices is leaking. We learned that. Right? It's very common, this check valve. Corey, how would I fix it? <laughs> Ignore it. Not me. Not at all. I know what you would do. What would you do for real? If you walked in and you saw that, what would be the first thing you'd do? Foul it off. And see if it thaws out. Mm -hmm. You'd hit it with something. Oh, well. <laughs> I have to, I have he to, gave you the video answer. <laughs> yeah, I got to do that. It was smacked with a uh, different. A, a, more, let me, a less educated, more intuitive tech would smack that with a hammer, right? Um, I I I'm going to use the, the rubber end of my large Christmas. <laughs> okay. I have a specific right. dental hammer. Or, or my dental right. hammer, right? <laughs> yeah, and that, that, will, it will, that will often free up our crap, right? Because what is our crap? Our crap is the same stuff that was in my oil separator. It's going to be that mud from really crappy oil that I've cooked and it's gotten too hot. Throw in some metal shavings, throw in Kalos came in here with a sawzall instead of a pipe cutter. You know, you throw in all that crap. And, 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 and it's going to be circulating right through the whole system. Well, we're coming out of here, we're just going through the condenser before we're going to hit that check valve. Right? That's where it's going. So that's probably going to clear it. Uh, we can use a magnet to detect where that, where the uh, plate is that seals. Yep. Right? We can, we can detect that with a magnet, feel it, give it a whack and see if it moves. Okay? Mm -hmm. Often it will. Oh yeah. But that's what it's gonna that's what it's gonna look like. All right. That's what's gonna that's what we're gonna see is, is a lot of ice. Because I'm leaking, so I'm trying to pump out one circuit and it's constantly being recharged with liquid refrigerant because it's leaking. So I'm constantly pumping it out. That's why it'll be iced up. All right? When we go into split, it should get cold. It's a metering device. It's refrigerating, right? Mm -hmm. So when we go into split, we should be able to detect that it's cold. When we walk into a store and and we're just in 50%, we don't know how long we've been there, we can touch that thing and, and as long as our check valve's not bad, get a pretty good, you know, the ambient on the ground. Yeah. yeah. It's been two hours, right? You know, I finished pumping out a couple hours ago. It's warming up. Or it's still, you know, still sweat, right? Just went into split an hour ago. IV we can see that right there. All right, so here's here's what it looks like. That ain't pretty at all, right? Uh, it looks kind of rigged. Okay, it's just a, it's a cap tube. This is just a capillary tube, and we've wrapped it around a piece of insulation so it won't rub on itself and create a hole. That's the only reason that black insulation is there and it's coiled up. But if you look at it right here, you can see it is literally a cap tube. We're coming out of a quarter inch piece of pipe, and we just go to a tiny tube, and then we're dumping right into the suction header. Yep. That's all it is. Not, right. not important, but you'll see that, and then you'll see uh, the foam tape. They'll spread it out and like squeeze the tape together in between each. Sure. 
Right. Just another way to keep keep the cap tube from rubbing. Yeah. Okay. The other thing that you're going to find that I didn't get a picture of is right above this picture is a solenoid. Yep. Right. So there's a solenoid that will prevent this from feeding refrigerant when I'm not in split. Yep. Right. When I'm running 100%, I don't want this thing feeding all summer long. Right. So I've got a solenoid that will shut it off. The solenoid is going to be wired into the exact same circuit as the solenoid on my 50% split or my three-way valve if I have that version. Right? It's got a coil that actuates a three-way valve. Both of those will be wired into this solenoid. Yep. Right? In series. If I get one, I get them both. The difference is the solenoid feeding that capillary is a normally closed solenoid. It's Correct. Ever when I energize it, it opens. Normally open. So when you're closing the condenser solenoid, you're opening the capillary tube solenoid. Exactly. And then vice versa, when you're energizing 100%, you're de-energizing your, your capillary tube solenoid, or your bleed solenoid. Exactly. Exactly. So if I walk into a store that's in 50% split, oh, has been in 50% split, and I screw my gauge onto the half that's closed, that's not what we're not using, what pressure should I see? Yeah. The Yankee. The Yankee knows. Come on, Yankee. Any, any of you Southern boys know? Wait, what was the question? If we walk into a rack that is in 50% split, has been for a little while, and I screw my gauge onto the half that's not functional, not working. Uh, technically zero. It's what? Right. Right. Zero. 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 Yeah, right. Mm, so no, it's no, not. Zero. Where are you screwing your gauge onto? How are you, you going to pump down to zero? Yeah, you're not going to pump down. You're not going to pump down to zero. You're pumping it into the suction header. So you're only going to be zero. It's zero. You got to leak. All right, suction pressure. That's it. You know, no holdback valve. Yeah. We're going to talk a lot about A8s and A9 it's valves. Cold up here, down but here. these holdback valves don't have to be that. Right? They're they're just the most common. So I felt like this would be a pretty good platform to talk about A8s. Right, just in general. So, so we will talk a little bit about A8 valve. Understand that we're using A8 in this drawing, and all of our old school stuff. That was the most common. So let's talk about this. We call this valve the holdback valve. That's what we call it, or we call it the drain regulator. It's another term that so, that we use. Right. What we're talking about is this pipe that comes out of my condenser. You know, those check valves we just looked at. Right. We call that the drop leg. Right? Whether these are the you know technically correct or not doesn't matter. That's what we call that pipe that comes out of my condenser and goes into my store because traditionally my condenser is taller than my rack, so that liquid is dropping into into my rack. All right. So so that's that's why we use the term drop. Okay. But what we're actually talking about is a pipe that's 100 percent full of Liquid, mm -hmm. right? Maybe even some cool, a little bit. Okay, so that refrigerant that's coming out of my condenser, if I measure the pressure of that and it's too low, and I've gone to 50%, I've turned off all my fans, right? How can I get that up? How can I get that pressure up? Well, I can either add more heat, I can't do that because I don't have enough load, so I can't bring on extra compressors. So I've got to reject less heat. I've got to reject even less heat. My condenser has got to get smaller, mm -hmm. right? But I've run out of things to turn off, okay? So this is what he was talking about with stacking, right? This is where the term stacking comes from. Mm -hmm. What we're going to do is this valve is going to be at the bottom of that drop leg, all right? What I'm going to do with this valve is start closing it. Mm -hmm. I'm going to make my pipe smaller. Mm -hmm. As my pipe gets smaller, that's a restriction, well, there's, right? There's, that's going to cause my liquid refrigerant to stack inside my condenser, and it can't drain out enough, right? This is my drain leg. I'm closing my drain leg, so I can't drain enough, right? So my liquid is going to start building inside the condenser, right? As my liquid starts filling my condenser, there's less space for my condenser to reject heat. I'm making it smaller. I'm making it smaller. Yep. Building your head That's the building. concept, all right? So if you've heard the term flooded condenser, That's what we're talking flood, this is what we're doing. We're flooding it with liquid, right? We're filling what's supposed to be gas and liquid. It's now liquid, 
I can't condense there, it's already condensed, yep. mm -hmm. right? So the more of that that I fill, the smaller and smaller my condenser gets. Yep. And you would see measurable subcooling there then. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> Big oh, yeah. 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 I've seen 49 degrees of subcooling. Hell yeah. I don't know. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it would be so cool like that, right? Yeah. The one that yeah. pulled back valve open is gone. All yeah. of it's gone. Immediately right. on That's loud, by the way. It sounds like a big yeah. rush. <laughs> um, <laughs> All right. So those are, but those are like that when it says 165. It, so basically it works just like your Y1236 or whatever. So it's going to, it's not going to allow the pressure to. It's deep. to go it's below pull back to 165. All right. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna talk about this for a minute and get this nailed down. All right, but before we do, I just want to go through this process just a just yeah, 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 yeah. few few more steps, and then we'll get into the valve itself. All right. Uh, so the concept here is I'm I'm reducing the size of my condenser, right? And and when it gets to be too much, and I've reduced it too much, then I let some of that liquid back out. Right, so I can continuously flood more or less and maintain it an exact pressure. Whatever. Right, so it'll change how much is is flooded based on how cold that it is. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, for us in Florida, that's it. We're never going beyond that. Right. <laughs> but you know, I told you minus forty, minus thirty, Lake Michigan up there on TUP. <laughs> they got seventy mile an hour wind blowing through there. Yeah, no thanks. Uh, I don't care if you got a fan motor on or not. If you got 70, 70 mile an hour wind, you're gonna move air through your condenser. No, right? See, Ryan's right? a before, they don't like that. So, so the next and final stage that we don't experience, but it definitely happens up north, is a set of dampers, yep. right? So what they'll have basically all along the bottom of our condenser that's wide open, and we can literally just walk you know, underneath there if we want. If it's sheet metal. <laughs> yeah, it's a big chunk of sheet metal with air conditioning dampers. Yep. Just like inside a unit, in, inside a, uh, RT okay, bigger right on <clears throat> Yeah, and in the summer they're open, and after we go to flooding, and our pressure continues to drop, and we fill the whole condenser full of liquid. They're taking our job. We're gonna sh we're gonna shut <laughs> we're gonna shut it off so the wind can't. And this is almost always a wind problem, right? Mm -hmm. So the wind can't blow through there and act like fan motors. The other way you can get by that is tarping off the condenser. Right. Yeah. If it's not a permanent fix, it only happens every once in a while. Yeah. The drawing says 165 pounds. Let's talk about these pressures mm -hmm. because this really matters. This is where, as service techs and installers, we can screw things up pretty badly. Mm -hmm. All right, don't write that 165 down and go say I'm going to go set that to 165. That's not how this works. All right, the way this works is when I'm staging off my fans. When I stage off my last fan, whatever pressure that is. My whole back valve must be set below that pressure, mm -hmm. right? T traditionally, we choose 10 pounds just to be safe because it really is that important. We want to be well clear, right? Often five is used, okay, depending on how low that pressure is getting. So let's think about this for a minute. If this says 165, that means my last band should be shutting off at 170 or 175. That's actually kind of high. Right? We really don't have to hold our discharge pressure up that high. Yeah, how, yeah. how high do we need to hold our discharge 40, pressure? 135 is and 140. And I see the set points. 145 to 135. All right, so you're throwing numbers out based on what? Oh, yeah. No, no, no I'm saying based on the you said what pressure, right. not temperature. So, like, what did he Well, that's what I'm saying. Shh. Let him say it. All right, go ahead. <laughs> Speak. <laughs> go ahead, Based on what the expansion of the list is still... All right. Oh, man. The, the differential. Thank you. Thank you. Differential across my valve, right? My so what? Ball. So how much pressure does my valve need? Let's say we're going to run a Sporlin TXV, and we want a 90-pound pressure drop. So if I'm figuring out how low my discharge can get, what's the other number i got to know? The pressure across your expansion device. Well, it's, if it's 90 PSI minimum, pressure across it. What? Nope, I don't know. Uh, uh, that, give me 90, 90 pounds, is that my discharge? Yes. No. no. So I'm running my evaporator at zero. So 90 of both suction. 90 of suction. suction. It's 90 differential. i got to know suction. i got to have suction. All right? So it's 90 above my suction. Well, that means 
Low temp, medium temp are going to have different values, are they not? Oh, hi. So you're going to be 10, 10 psi right. below 90 plus or such. All right. So then, then, yeah. at, at a minimum. Okay. So, you're take, so, so at 90, mm. that's where you're going to set your whole back. Yeah, so let's say I'm running a 20 psi suction on my rack, right? I'm running 20 psi, I need 90. That means my minimum discharge pressure can be 110. Oh, so it's just like setting the power line stages off. At For it seems, sounds pretty similar, right? Yeah. Right. So 110 would be the absolute lowest I could possibly go. Do I want to shut off my fans at 110? No, I don't have any room for my whole back valve. Uh, yeah, right? So I've got to be above that. Everything's got to be above uh, area. So there's okay. room to play with. All right? What if I've got a suction of 40? 90 above suction. The highest you want to go is 10 PSI. Um, last fan. Then you need to be at 130. 130. 130. 130. Sorry, I have math wrong. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But, now, but you're seeing the change, right? Now I just went from low temp to medium temp. i got to be at 130. At the absolute bottom. So, so, so it is going to vary, and I've got to do this math to figure all this out, to figure out where to start. I'm starting with my whole back valve. That's where it starts. All right? So I've got to have at least 15 to 20 pounds below that, below my minimum. All right? And we'll get to that in a minute, and, and you'll understand why. Okay? 15 to 20 pounds. That's the question. So if I come up with 130, 150 is going to be my setting on my whole back valve. Yep. All right. I'm going to set that at 150, and I'm not going to shut off my last fan until 160, and then the next bank of fans, 165, 170, 175. This is how I'm going to work this out, not the other way around. Right? That's a very southern thing to do is start with my fans. <laughs> when am I going to turn off that fan? Well, that's how the engineers spec it when they write it out. Right. Start with the pressure differential across the valve and work their way up, yep. not the other way down. And that's why we're that's why we're covering it that way. So we're not that, that's how you're gonna figure this out. Okay. That's how you can figure it out. And we'll talk about that missing 15, 20 pounds in a few minutes, but so so here's here's my concept. Instead of 165 in this case, let's say we ended up with 150 pounds, right? My whole back valve is going to maintain 150 by flooding my condenser and making it smaller and smaller. Mm -hmm. I, I've got a problem now. What's the pressure on the other side of my a my whole back valve? It's going down. I got a restriction. My evaporators are still using all the pressure that they lower, were. Lower than your. So yeah, it's going to be lower. My pressure is going to start falling on my liquid that's coming out of my A valve. Well, I just said 150. That's the whole freaking point. Stay above 150. All right. So now, but now I've got this problem, right? So I've got my discharge. I maintain the discharge pressure I wanted, but my cases aren't getting it because I've got a restriction that let me get that pressure. Mm -hmm. So I got to get that pressure to my case liquid. Mm -hmm. All right, we're going to do that using our receiver. Our that's where this now low pressure, right? Let's say this liquid is at 120. That's what it wants to fall to. I'm going into this receiver. I'm way too low. Oh, it's taking vapor. And now the A9 valve is picking up this discharge that's all at 150 now, right? Because we pumped it up. And we're going to flow that through this A9 valve, and we're going to pressurize this whole receiver back up. I have to use two valves to do this, all right? This is doing the same job on a, on a single condenser setup, you know, one compressor, one evaporator, walk-in freezer, remote condenser, right? If we've got a headmaster. Yep. It's the same job. Yep. Lower Oops. Right? So we're just doing, we're doing the headmaster thing. We're just doing it great big. Stop. We're breaking out the two valves. So we've got one that's holding back and the one that's pumping the liquid back up with that new pressure, that new higher pressure. All right? Why do we want to go, why do we want to throw that extra 15, 20 pounds on there? Because that's the difference between our A8 and our A9. Mm -hmm. Okay, we can't set them to exactly the same pressure. Yep. That's our difference. All right. So there's a few settings here that we've got to keep straight as technicians. Because guess what? My wrench will fit on top of this A8 <laughs> and this A9. <laughs> that and means yours all, does too. And that means the next guy down the road who doesn't know nothing about any of this. May have been jacking with that when he was having a problem and misdiagnosed what he was doing, mm -hmm. right? So, so, so how are we setting these up? All right. 
for the A8 valve, when we adjust that pressure on that A8 valve, we must be 100% sure that the pressure we're setting that A8 valve is below the last fan shutting off. Mm -hmm. If it does not, if I raise the A8 too much, what will happen is I'm trying to make my condenser smaller by flooding it, but I'm running fans. I'm going to fill the whole thing full of liquid, right? I'm going to run out of refrigerant. The way that this is going to present is your discharge pressure fell and it just kept falling and then finally it bottomed bought out and it looked, you know, set there at 150, just like I want. Look just like that. So I'm looking at that and then I've got a receiver alarm that came on somewhere in here, mm -hmm. right? And then all of my case stems started going up. Mm -hmm. And I'm out here because I got 27 cases in alarm. But nothing wrong with the rack. And then eight, nine o'clock in the morning, it comes back. Everything so, comes back. So, and you're like, Whoa. So this is how he's nailing it, right? So 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 what's happened is I packed all of my liquid into my condenser. All of it. And I don't have any of my cases anymore, right? I've got a streaming, I got the stream running through my sight glass. Yeah. Right? I've got some liquid going to my TXB, he's not near enough. Okay. They're all starving. So my cases all start running warm. Mm -hmm. Okay, that launches my alarm. How long, how long above alarm do we have to be before we get a four hours? Or two hours? 90 minutes. Okay. 90 minutes. So if we cross the red line, 10 degrees above target, for 90 minutes, we get a service call. What's the coldest, coldest point in the day? Mm -hmm. Two o'clock at night and sometimes late at night. Who knows? Are we a weather boys? Anybody hunt? Nobody? Uh, 5 a.m. There you go. All right, right before the sun comes up, right? I hope Is it? <laughs> Nobody's been outside, not drunk, at 5 a.m. <laughs> right. It's warm at midnight. It's cold before morning. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! All right, all the Yankees know this because the, you know this is the time I'm, I think I'm going to die, and they start looking at their watch, going, "I got another hour. I just got to survive yes. one more hour." Uh, all right. So, so the way this plays out, guys, practically, here's how it goes. Right? If we've got this this whole back valve adjusted incorrectly, how would that happen? Well, I don't know. We did service work any time other than two o'clock in the morning on January 17th, right? Anytime we touch that valve in July. We're guessing at a setting. Yep. Okay. So the way that service call is going to come in is 5 o'clock in the morning, all of our stuff warms up. 6 o'clock in the morning, 6.30, they oh. generate the alarm. Yep. Right? It takes me an hour you know, to get my shit together and get to the store. I pull in the parking lot at 7.30 <laughs> or 8 o'clock. Mm -hmm. What's going on with Mr. Sun? It's right. In. It's up. Right. <laughs> hmm. No longer need my whole back. Mm -hmm. Right? Above 60 degrees. I walk in, everything's golden, all the cases pulling down the temp. Sound familiar? <laughs> okay. All right, that's what it looks like. That's how it's going to play out. We're going to get that early morning service call, everything's warm. You show up, everything is just fine. All right? You want to check your whole back valve. You want to check your discharge pressure. How low did your discharge pressure go? <laughs> Okay. And if we're in a period, if somebody has touched that valve, right, then they were guessing when they put it back. Mm -hmm. well, it may be wrong. But what if it's a, a CDS valve? Right. Totally different scenario. Okay. Because we know that that's going to control exactly. And we'll talk about that in a minute, too. Like I said, I wanted to spend a few minutes on an A8 and A9 and the differences between these valves uh, before we do that. So okay. If you were to replace said valve, should for whatever reason it need to be replaced? Yep. When would you set it up? You just wait till it's cold outside? So ideally, that's exactly what you would do. But unfortunately, that's not practical. Yeah, right? yeah it's causing a problem in the summer, right? Yeah. So it's probably not going to be an issue in the summer. We can, the manufacturer tells us how many turns for PSIs. Right? So we can make a guess based on that. So if I, if I know my target is supposed to be, I go to my stop and I turn it three and a half turns, three and three quarters turns. Do you think there's ever a scenario where we're going to run into any conditions that's going to affect, affect yes. us in the summertime like that? Or in the wintertime? I mean, it'd have to be grossly off, right? Yeah. If it's supposed to be 150 in the summer, you're running 250? Yeah. Okay. Right? I mean, you, 
it'd have to be way off. It'd have to you be know. extremely far off. Right. But it could have happened? Sure. I mean, that screw will keep on going. <laughs> Just keep on turning. All right. So, so this, is, uh, this is what it looks like, right? This is my A8. It's in that liquid line that's going to my receiver. Okay? That's what it looks like. Does that look kind of like an EPR? Yep. So here's our A8 valve. Now, there's a couple different sizes, all right? That's what some of the letters mean uh, on, our, on our valve. The other letters are going to describe what it's doing and how it does it, all right? If we have an open on rise of inlet, O-R-I. Those letters sound kind of familiar? Yep. Yeah. Sort it, valve, for it, valve. For it, valve right. All those type valves are open on rise of inlet. Open on rise of inlet. What that means, it's going to control, if it's opening on the rise, it's going to control that inlet pressure, right, and hold it above a certain spot. So it can't fall too far. It's going to hold it up. Is that not what an EPR is doing? It's exactly what an EPR is doing. It's holding our evaporator pressure so it can't fall too far. All right? So in this case, in this one case, all right, our holdback valve and our EPR are the same valve. There's a difference. Can I take this valve off and use it as an EPR? Can I take an EPR and use it as this valve? No. Why? Because it's not a sport valve, right? It's got a solenoid, but the solenoid doesn't close the valve. The solenoid overrides the valve. Oh, wait, what? All right. What? So on my EPR, I've got a solenoid that causes the valve to close, become a suction stop. Right? Well, this valve is my holdback valve. I don't want to close my liquid line completely, 100% ever. Right? I don't want to do that. But what I might want to do is make it so it doesn't regulate at all. It's wide open. Mm -hmm. wow. Yeah, of course. That's what it's going to do most of the time. Right? It's not going to regulate at all. So, it's just it's it's so I'm going to use my solenoid to override it. I'm going to make my solenoid override its ability to, to regulate. I'm going to run all summer long like that. Mm -hmm. In fact, I'm going to, my program is not even going to turn on the solenoid to let it begin to try to regulate until after my last fan shuts off. Mm -hmm. Right? Or my VFD hits 0%. Yes, sir. So for, is it still an A8 no matter what situation is being used in, whether it's used for EPR or yep. holdback? Correct. Okay, so they're, they're going to have different letters. Yeah. All right? My EPR is going to have an S. It's going to lead with an S. Solenoid. Right? For the solenoid, and that's the shutoff ability. All right? My holdback valve is going to have a BL. The B is what the solenoid means that causes an override, so it won't regulate anymore. Mm -hmm. not all Which the B is for bypass, by the way. Uh, not all EPRs don't have the all a, a EPRs. EPRs don't have the bypass feature. No. Well, no, 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 no. I'm, not, I'm saying uh, the solenoid. They don't have, some of them don't have that solenoid feature, but they're still. If you don't have the solenoid on an A8 that's being used as an EPR, it's on a loop. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you're feeding multiple circuits, and they have solenoids in the store. Correct. Correct. Yeah, right. yeah, if, you have a, if you have a single circuit, what kind of EPR is it'll have a solenoid. <laughs> it'll have a solenoid on the, EP, on the A8. Uh -huh. Right? That would yeah. be the difference between the two. This is still right? new to me. Yeah. So this guy is controlling liquid. There, there. This guy's regulating liquid. My EPR is regulating vapor. Uh -huh. Pretty cool, right? Because my sport valve sure as hell can't do both. Right. This guy doesn't care. Right? That's kind of cool. That's kind of cool. All right, so for my A8, all of my A8s have the same common feature, and that is my inlet comes in here, and I'm going to flow through this spot. Right? This is, yep. this is my regulation. This is where my regulation happens. It's a big piston, and this piston moves down and exposes more of this taper, making the hole bigger. Mm -hmm. right? That's how an A8 operates. That pushes down, and that opens that hole. It makes it larger. The farther down it goes, the larger the hole. Okay? 
when we're specking this valve, when we're saying, I want a 17. Anybody ever heard that? I need a port 17 or I need a port 13. Yeah, and I never know what I'm saying either. All right. They're, talk, they're talking about this hole. They're talking about the size of this hole. Right? 17. What does 17 mean? That doesn't make any sense. It's eighths of an inch. Right? So a sport eight will have a one inch hole. A sport 16 will have a two inch hole. Does that make sense? Everything's always, those numbers are always eighths of an inch. And that's why we were able to get away with replacing everything but that. Correct. Okay, hang on a second. Can you repeat? Yeah, for one, so more, flawless, I thought one we did more it time. One, one more time. <laughs> okay. All right, so All right. so the number is determined. To, so an eight is an eighth. Hold on, more. Go ahead. Do All right, the number is the number of eighths of an inch. Uh, eighths of an inch. And that's that third number. Okay. So that's our eight first. One. That's the first number. That's the first. All right, so I have my I have my A8, and then I have a series of letters, right? Yeah, that's yeah. telling me if it's got a, a solenoid. It's telling me if I've got a bypass feature. It's telling me all those things. Then it's going to have a dash, and it's going to give me a number. Oh, okay, that's that's going to be 8, 17, 13, something like that. That's going to be the size of the hole inside the pipe. Two and an eighth inch pipe. 17. 17. Two, one point, or point one two five, seven, 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 all right. two, five, The second number is going to be the size of the copper that I'm going to solder together, mm -hmm. right? So it's not uncommon for those two numbers to be the same, but they don't have to be, right? Right. So I could have an A8, A2, dash 17, which tells me two and an eighth inch hole, dash 17, which tells me it's two and an eighth copper going in and out, right? 17 set port, 17, 17. Got it. Bang. Got it. We just unlocked the mystery. All that googly gunk. All right. Back to our same store. This picture is actually from that exact store that I started out with, with our solenoids, and then our check valves that we argued about for a little while before we realized that they are exactly. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? yeah. Now we can see here, this is what this is the other end. All right, this is my liquid line that's going towards my receiver. Right? Well, instead of having a whole back valve like the A8 we yes. just looked at, got my electronic. Mm -hmm. Okay. I just have an electronic valve and Sporlin makes a controller that looks exactly like my Sporlin subcooler, right? And that instead of saying subcool, it says pressure, pressure, alarm. <laughs> right? Alarm. So, <laughs> 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 All right. Yeah. So, so these are Kelvins. These, these it's part of that Kelvin family, right? They're all the exact same hardware. It's literally just a software flash. What do they put in it? What's it looking for? What can it do? This particular one doesn't have a PT chart inside of it that's going to calculate superheat. Just not going to. My subcool controller is okay, everything superheat, right? Because it's driving a TXV. Okay? Mm -hmm. This guy is going to be running off pressure. It's trying to maintain a specific pressure. Now, you can land temperature sensors on this and figure SST and, and calculate subcooling, right? It will do that. That's the pressure side. Okay? That's what this pressure controller is doing. So this takes out that problem we were talking about that if it's, you know, if I'm changing this A8 in July, you're going to have to follow this process I'm going to send you to set this valve. It's not an easy process. It's not quick and it's not 100% accurate. All right? If I set this guy up for 150 pounds, yeah. it'll be 150 pounds. Yeah. As long as that's your inducer reads, right? Right. Until I have the traditional problems that I have with all of my electronics. Yeah. Right, my CDS valve goes to crap, loses at zero. Got too many steps programmed in it, whatever. That's right, when it reverts the temperature. Um, so if you have a temperature sensor landed on there, it'll revert the temperature. It can, but that's yeah, a, they that's don't a, spec it, so there's not that. Yeah, there, it is a programmable feature. Yeah, it can't calculate SST. All right, so uh, so anyway, that's uh, that's the more modern setup. This is one of the things we are doing. You know, the Kalos is doing. Right, we're going around to all these conventional setups taking them out because we're touching something else. And they want us, well, oh, while you're in there, go ahead and change your oil separator. Go ahead and add, yep. add your pressure control. That's what we're doing. So my A9 valve, right? We've already talked a little bit about it. We know that it's bringing in a higher pressure from this side and stepping it down. Right? We know that's what it's doing. That's the opposite of an EPR. Yep. It's exactly the opposite, right? EPR is opening our inlet on rise. He's looking at you, man. 
right? This one is closing our outlet on fall. Exact opposite. Our A9 valve, we're gonna call this in this setup with the A8, and we're using it using the A8 as our holdback valve. In this setup, we're gonna call this our pump up valve or hot gas bypass. All right, we're gonna use one of those terms. All right, our pump up valve or our hot gas bypass is taking our high discharge pressure that our A8 holdback valve created. Mm -hmm and putting it on top of our liquid and our liquid receiver so that I can push high pressure to my cases, right? But if it was the exact same pressure, we'd also pressurize the liquid to our holdback valve, and our holdback valve would see no difference between the pressures in the two, it would open, right? I have to have a pressure differential for my, for my AA to work, to even work. It has to have a differential because it's trying to control one side over the other. Well, if they're the same, it's just going to open, yeah. right? It's like an EPR with a 90 psi suction. It's going to be wide open, not right? doing nothing. Uh -huh. Well, that it won't control anything, right? So then you get caught in the cycle of opening and closing, opening and closing, opening. And closing. So I need a differential there, so that A8 valve sees that it's doing something, that it's holding back and creating higher pressure. So I've got to have a lower pressure on the outlet for it to control. So my A9 pumping that refrigerant back up. We can see if I pump that refrigerant back up and it goes right to the in, to the exit of the A8, here's my problem. So I have to have a 10 pound differential between them. It must be 10 pounds, right? I told you 15 to 20 earlier, right? Because if it has to be 10 to even work, are we going to set that to 10.001? Yeah, no. Let's go. Up. Let's get a little cushion in there. So this all is nice so and smooth. A9, 10 lower than A8. So so we're going to set it around 15 to 20 PSI lower than our A8 setting, all right? So this, now you see where all of our math went, right? We started with our TXV, with our 90 pounds, we added that to our suction. That number is the number for the A9, then we're gonna add 15 to 20, and we're gonna set our A8, then we're gonna add five to 10, and we're gonna turn on our first fan, and we're gonna add five more, all the way through. Let's say no split, no nothing, it has been activated, middle of summertime. Would you ever see any problems with these valves? Um, like in normal operation, like would they? Right, so, so let's say I burn out the solenoid coil on the A9 valve, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it no, it's no longer sitting there dormant. It's yeah. now, you know, trying to do something. Yeah. It's trying to hold above 150 PSI, I'm 250 outside of it. Mm -hmm. No problem. So it's not flop. Yes, it's, it's yeah, not going to be. My, my A9 yeah. valve, if you notice, yeah. my A9 doesn't have a coil. Yeah, yeah. so you're just going to... It's, it's always going to try to maintain that hot gas, in this case, 135. It's going to try to keep 135 PSI on my liquid receiver. Which, as long as my liquid receiver is over that, nothing's going to flow. Yeah, and it should be because you're full, 30%, 40% full of liquid. Right. Well, if, if, if a tech shows up and spins that guy and sets it to 250, <laughs> is it going to feed? Yeah. Yeah. It's going to try to. Okay, so it's pretty fail proof. In right? Summer. As my ambient yeah. changes and, and my liquid receiver falls and I've got hot gas coming off my condenser, by my compressor, one pound higher, yeah, it's going to try. What about if you have a massive leak in the store and it goes, you go off on lower then you have alarm. Then you're out of refrigerator. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll say, but it can, can, that will continue to do whatever it can for all the way down. <laughs> well, while you're you running have, out of refrigerator, yeah, well, you're, you're, you're going to shut off the compressors something. long before this is going to come yeah. into play. Yeah. If you're running out of refrigerator. You bypass them. If, <laughs> if, you're running, if you're running out of refrigerator, your suction will overcome. You're, yeah, you'll hit zero yeah. long before yeah. you're going to run out of discharge. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Long before. Yeah. Gotcha. It's a fair question. Yeah. All right. So here's the inside of my, my A9. These are incredibly similar, right? My flow is coming in the same direction. And if you notice, my piston in this scenario, instead of pulling up, it's pushing down. It's plugging this entire setup. So it's going to feed the same, it's, it's technically the inside piston is going to do the same thing. It's just doing it on the opposite side. Instead of plugging, it's, it's plugging top, pulling out of the bottom. Right? It's very similar setups. Very similar setups. 
All right, I am sensing my outlet. Traditionally, now there are there are exceptions to this. There are variances that are specialized valves. I can order this in a couple different configurations. But the biggest difference between them normally, a typical setup, is the A8 is controlling pressure on the inlet. The A9 is controlling pressure on the outlet. That's really the biggest difference. Okay, for, for a traditional setup. Two different ways I can do that for both valves, depending on the version I get. I can either say I want a differential. I want you to look at both pressures and I want you to maintain a specific pressure. Right? In other words, I want to run 15 pounds higher than the other value. Then I, my screw is adjusting how many PSI that is. 15 is where I stop. Right? That's one version. The other version is I want a fixed number. I want to maintain 135. I, then my screw is going from 130 to 135 to 140 to 145. Right? right? Those are the two versions of both valves. Okay, so I've got to know, do I have the differential version or do I have the absolute value version? Right, my A8 is usually going to be controlling the inlet pressure, my A9, the outlet. But either one could be either a differential or a regulator? Correct. Okay. Based on its model. That's right. Thanks for watching. If you're willing, give this video a thumbs up and drop us a comment. Don't forget to hit that bell icon to stay updated with all of our future videos. And as a quick reminder, HVAC School isn't just a YouTube channel. Dive deeper with us at our main website, HVACRschool.com. Curious for more knowledge on the go? We've got you covered. Tune into the HVAC School podcast, available on all your favorite podcast apps. And while you're at it, join our thriving Facebook group. Also, don't miss out on our free mobile applications, available for both iPhone and Android. We're all about community. Vortex by Tex.